All right, everybody, thank you for coming this afternoon. Last breakout of the day, and then we get to go listen to uh, stories about Pixar, which I'm looking forward to. Uh, my name is Brandon Keepers. I'm the open source lead at GitHub. And today I want to talk about uh, how open source principles can apply to our own engineering teams. Um, so there, there's, there's no doubt that as an industry we've witnessed the success of open source software. Um, we've seen the open source process create extremely high quality systems that scale uh, to, to you know, massive levels. Um, and, and this is applied to, to systems like you know, operating systems or distributed databases or web browsers, uh, pieces of software that are not simple. Um, and so today I want to talk about what some of the, the principles behind open source are that, that may lead to those designs and, and think about how we can apply some of those to our internal teams. Uh, what I hope you take away from this session today are, are is somewhat, somewhat of a framework to think about how you can apply these principles to your team. Not necessarily, you know, there'll be a few specific tactics you can use, um, but I'm looking forward to the ways that you can see how these principles fit into your own team. So, kind of the general principles of open source are, are transparency, participation, and collaboration. When you, hear, when you hear people outside of the software world talk about applying open source to their realm. These are the three things they're talking about. Uh, so, so whether it's open government or open data, open society, any, anybody that's seen the success of open source and wants to figure out how to mimic it, what they're talking about is we want to figure out how to bring these attributes to it. So we want to, we want to expose processes and information, make them transparent. We want to enable people to participate. Um, and then we, hopefully through that participation, we can actually collaborate and build something useful together. Uh, and so I, today I want to talk about how I think that these principles have somewhat of a cascading effect. Um, you, know, you can't have collaboration without people participating. You can't have participation without transparency. And, I want, and specifically I want to talk about the communication structures that I think create these things. So let's start with transparency. Um, obviously, in open source, the source code is open, right? Uh, it, it's available for anyone to ins inspect. You can take it apart. You can examine it. Uh, you can even fix it. Uh, you can learn about good and bad design patterns. Um, but that's not necessarily what we're going to talk about today. I mean, I doubt m most of us on in internal teams want to release the source code. Um, but the reality is that that's not actually where the value of open source software comes. Some people do do those things. Some people look at the source code and take it apart. Some people learn from it. But most people don't. Um, but we still benefit from the value of that source code being available. The source code is an artifact uh, of a production process. Uh, and what's interesting about production processes is they generally have a larger impact than the thing that they create. Like once you, once you figure out a new way of making things, the entire world can take that process and, and apply it to the things that they make. Um, so we saw this with uh, you know, Henry Ford in the automobile. Like it wasn't the fact that Henry Ford made a better car, he figured out a better way to make cars, and that thus enabled an entire industry to take off. Um, and so th this artifact, again, is not of a specific process, it's not of a, um, you know, it's not a development methodology, it's not, uh, you know, the result of understanding a specific user's needs. But I would argue that it's the communication structure. So in the late 60s, uh, there was a guy named Melvin Conway who wrote this paper called How Committees Invent. Um, and the, the central thesis of that paper was any organization that designs a system will inevitably produce a design whose structure is a copy of the organization's communication structure. Now, I think this is really interesting. Um, kind of to give an example of this, uh, you know, if you took a, a traditional team of software developers, uh, say five people, and you asked them to design a system, according to Conway's law, um, you would basically end up with a system that had at least four parts. Uh, and I say four because you'd have four engineers doing work and then one manager, uh, theoretically. Um, so the example that, that is often given, if you, know, if you ask them to write a compiler, you'd end up with a four-phase compiler. Uh, and it would work because the way that this team communicates, you have you know, a manager that kind of ties everything together, but there would be at least four distinct components in that. 
So I think that this, uh, you know, this is a really interesting observation. The paper that he wrote is very short, so I'd encourage you to go read it. Um, but it's had a huge inf impact on, on some of the thinking of, you know, development methodologies and, um, like, the book The Mythical Man Month by Fred Brooks, Brooks uh, cites this and, and kind of uses it to, to form its thinking. So if we look at the way that open source communities communicate, um, we first have to look at the, the constraints that they have. So, the, so open source communities are distributed uh, geographically across time zones and even across cultures. Uh, this means that they don't have the benefit of you know, high fidelity communication, right? You, you can't walk over and tap somebody on the shoulder when you're stuck on a problem. Uh, you can't jump into a meeting when you're trying to work through a, through a problem. Um, you can't even you know, stand around the water cooler and chat just to, to get to know each other. So this means that these projects have to accept certain constraints uh, in, in their workflow. Um, so several years ago, Ryan Tomeko, who was actually the original GitHub engineer, the first engineer hired at GitHub, talked about a lot of these. So, so a lot of what I'm going to talk about next comes from him. And then also uh, Ben Balter, who's giving a talk right now on GitHub Pages, has done a lot of work in, in trying to articulate some of these ideas. So open source projects uh, use this, basically use tools that enforce this communication structure. The medium is electronic, it's asynchronous, it's lock free, and the result of those three things is that the message is archived. So let's dive into to what that means. So the medium is electronic. Open source communities opt, obviously, for tools that are electronic. Uh, the internet and, and technology in general has played a huge role in even enabling this like, massive collaboration. So you have things like Issue Tracker, which is just this ongoing list of either possible improvements, bugs, um, ideas. And this, this Issue Tracker is open to anybody that wants to get involved in the project. You can go in and look at all of the discussions that have happened in the entire history of the project. It kind of creates this like, corpus of possible improvements for the software. You have version control, which I think most of us take for granted, but most uh, most other professions don't have the ability or, or even you know, the, any, any form of tool that will let them go off and, and do these experiments, maybe throw them away, maybe bring them back, um, but at any point in time, go back and look at the history of how this project evolved. And then obviously we have you know, mailing lists and chats, which are kind of a natural extension of, of how we would communicate, but just taken to the electronic form. So the tools that, that open source communities opt into are electronic. They're also inherently asynchronous. Um, there's no means in an open source community for me to demand the attention of somebody else right now. I can ping them on chat, I can uh, you know, send them an email, but there's no guarantee that that message will come back to me, um, and so there's no point in me necessarily waiting for that. And I mean, this is obviously, open source developers are rarely in the same place at the same time, let alone different places at the, sa at the same time. Um, so these are constraints that they just have to accept and have to deal with. This also means that the medium is lock free. If I assume that I'm not going to get a response, then I can't design processes that expect an immediate response. Um, and so this is kind of the, you know, if you look at like version control, this is, this is kind of the inherent uh, design of distributed version controls, uh, sort of version control systems. Like anybody can start to move a feature forward without any dependence or reliance on anyone else. You know, I could check out a branch and start working on it, and you could check out a branch and start working on it. At some point, we have to resolve that conflict, but the progress of both of our work is not locked in any way. Um, you also, in this, in this process of open source, you push approval and rejection to a review phase. You don't have this, this situation where you do a bunch of work, do a bunch of work, do a bunch of work, and then finally ask for review once you're done. Like you can start that process as soon as possible, um, and then the point at which the work is done, you can continue on. So then the nature of all of these tools basically means that the message is archived. Uh, issues and pull requests show history. You know, version control obviously has, has a history. Um, li mailing lists have archives, and, and chat has a log. So you can see it at any, at any point when you join the project, you now can see the entire history of the project. Anytime you have an issue, so let's say you run into a bug in production, as soon as you find out where that bug is coming from, 
you can trace back the history of how that came to be. You can look at the decision-making process, decision process and all of that, um, and hopefully institute changes to, to prevent that from happening. So we'll like, here's a recent example of this. Um, I had a bunch of data a few weeks ago that I wanted to figure out how to process, and I'm like, well, I wonder if anyone at GitHub has ever used Hadoop. Because um, I, have, I haven't worked on a team that has. And so I go to GitHub and I search Hadoop, and then at GitHub, which limits it to the GitHub organization. And I find out that there's actually 330-some conversations, issues, pull requests, dealing with Hadoop, and our, one, you know, our analytics team basically has a Hadoop cluster, um, and so I was able to go ask them some of these questions. So these are kind of inherently the, the things that we get from the tools that we choose in open source. So to review, like here's, here's the structure of communication in open source. The, you know, the medium is electronic, it's asynchronous, it's lock free. And, and the result is that the message is archived. So what does this have to say, what does this have to do with transparency? Uh, well, here's, here's the result of those, pr those properties of the way that we communicate in open source. Uh, information is exposed to others working towards shared goals. Uh, simply the process of doing work makes that information available to them. Work towards a goal is rarely blocked, um, if ever. And anyone can participate re regardless of geography, time zone, culture, or even role. So, so whether I'm you know, at a meeting or out to lunch or on vacation, uh, as soon as I get back, I can catch up on everything that's happened in my project. You know, I didn't have to worry about missing out on information um, because a meeting happened and I wasn't there. So these, trans, uh, excuse me, these uh, transparent parent communication tools help to break down silos in our organizations and, and eliminate some of the tribal knowledge. And so that's where we get transparency from. So next I want to talk about participation. Um, so when we embrace these tools that are inherently transparent, that create uh, message archives as we work, uh, we naturally leave this paper trail, right, where anybody can come along and look at the work that we're doing and, and gain the necessary context. But making this massive stack of information available is not actually enough to get people to participate in the work now that's being done. So I want to talk about two things that I think are extremely important in the open source world that we do um, that enables people to then participate. So we, we, we work on minimizing friction and we work on automating review. So uh, my, my colleague Ben Balter that I mentioned uh, defines friction in this way and I absolutely love it. Friction is the amount of time that elapses between I want to contribute and I have contributed. Uh, so our goal should be to make that as close to zero as possible. Uh, you know, potential contributors should never have to come talk to us or ask us for information in order to get involved in a project. So the way that we do that in open source is we distill this huge body of information that we created naturally from the tools that we use. So even, you know, Basically, it's, it's not practical for somebody to come along and say, oh, okay, I'll just look through all of the issues and discussions and archive and whatever and figure out how this project works. And so we work on documentation, right, which is, as developers, kind of our favorite word. Um, but, but documentation is extremely important because it allows us to, to proactively communicate the latest thinking about how this project works. And again, it doesn't matter what our methodology is. Like, you take all of the information that's accumulated over time and you distill it down to knowledge that you can then you know, give to, any, to anybody that's coming to the project. So we, we do that with you know, the README is an extremely important tool in, in giving people insight into how to get started with the project and use it. And then the contributing documents are, are you know, how, do, how do you actually give back to this project, not just how do you use it. Uh, we also do that by automating some things. So uh, to reduce friction, uh, every project inside of the GitHub organization uh, that has executable code in it generally has these three scripts. So we do script bootstrap, script server, and script test. Uh, and, and often open source projects will do something similar. Basically, regardless of the technology that's written in, whether it's you know, a Node project or a Ruby project or even a C project, uh, you, can, you can clone the repo, run script bootstrap, which will set up your environment. You run script server or, or the equivalent to run whatever the code is, and script test will, will run the tests. So this allows, you know, like I'm not so extremely familiar with development in Node, uh, 
Um, but I can clone any of the projects that we have at GitHub that are Node, get them up and running, make a few changes, because I do know JavaScript quite well. I can run the test to make sure I didn't break anything, and then I can submit a pull request. So re removing the friction of getting started is one of the most important steps, because that's, that's generally where you lose people. And unfortunately, in an open source project, you don't actually know that you're losing them, because they haven't talked to you at all, right? If our goal is to make it so that they can, they can participate without asking permission, um, then we don't know that they're getting stuck in the, in the first process, which is actually getting the thing running. So the other way we enable people to participate is we automate review. Uh, and, and most of us have experienced this in like automated tests. Uh, you know, we, write, we write unit tests to make sure that the software does what we hope it should do um, and that it does what we want it to do you know, in six months or a year as people are changing the code. Uh, but I think it's important to, to think outside of just the, the realm of like, traditional unit testing. Um, automate anything that you can, anything that, that you do over and over and over again. So like, one of my, my favorite parts about this is that if, if you have really, you know, if you have things that you care a lot about, it gets really annoying when you're constantly telling your, your coworkers to also care about it. Um, but, but you can automate it and put it, you know, in a script, and then the continuous integration server tells them, or Hubot if you're running that, and now they're not mad at you, they're mad at the robot. So, so here's an example of this. Uh, we have a blog, so to, to post on the GitHub blog, you open a pull request in, in a blog repo. Um, and since 2008, we've actually had 198 different employees publish a blog post. And there's nobody inside of the organization that actually owns the blog. Um, it, it might belong to marketing, it might belong to PR, I think we're, we're figuring that out right now. But there's tons and tons of information over, that we've gathered over the years about what we think is the right way to make blog posts. So one way to, you know, we could have put that, written that down in documentation, said here's what, what we think is the best way to write blog posts. But instead what we've done is we've put that into code. So every time we decide here's how we want our blog to work, uh, we'll write tests for it. So when you, when you make a pull request to the GitHub blog, uh, there's at least, you know, these four tests now run. Uh, the first one is, is the, uh, the editorial calendar. So at some point we decided that we want to only do one post a day maximum. And, and when this became a problem, it would have been, I think a traditional organization would have been really easy to say, oh, like we want to prevent multiple posts from going out, then we'll you know, assign Susan to review every blog post and make sure that there's not one on every day. But Susan probably has better things to do with her time, so we can write code to do this. So all we do now is the, the first person that opens up a PR gets to, uh, a pull request, gets to pick the day that they want their blog post to go out, and now anybody else that opens a blog post, it'll, it'll give them this warning. It looks like you know, somebody else already has that day. So we've done this with a ton of other things. Um, we, we review for like certain grammar things. Uh, there, there's this awesome node package called Write Good, um, which my wife felt the need for me to explain to you that we know that Write Good is not how you would say you say Write Well, but... Oh. So yeah, we, we basically just check for basic, you know, like best practices in writing. Um, we, try to use, we try to use active voice as much as possible. Or even things like a post should contain more use than we's. Um, or all images should be hosted on GitHub. If you go back to really old blog posts on GitHub, you'll see that some of them are missing images. Um, and so the point at which we realize that, we're like, oh, let's add an automated test that makes sure that every image we use in a blog post is, is in a medium that we control so that it'll be here in, you know, five or ten years. So the interesting thing about doing this, as you, you know, so you use tools that, that um, create transparency, you then start to distill that information into knowledge. Like, as you automate it, it now enables the people that you're working with to focus on substance. No longer when somebody opens a pull request, you have to look like, oh, is this, is this conflicting with another day? Um, are they using active voice? All of those things now we know are taken care of. And the people that are reviewing it can focus on, is this good content? Uh, is this something that we actually want to be talking about? Are we missing details uh, you know, that might be relevant to a certain audience? So this is the value of automation. Um, as, as, people, as more and more people start to participate, you get a focus on, on the review of the substance. So to sum up this participation, um, document the knowledge in prose, 
or preferably code. Um, if, you can, if you do it in code, then you can execute it for free without having to worry about um, the time that it takes. So then the last thing I want to talk about is collaboration. Uh, when we adopt these communication structures that expose information and enable people to participate, then collaboration naturally starts to happen. It's not something that we have to actually do anything about. Um, the side effect of the tools that we've chosen actually exposes the process that our teams go through. Uh, so I love this about GitHub, like, uh, or any open source project, really. If you come in and watch the project for even just a day, you start to see the way that the project works. You start to see the patterns that they prefer. And so, you know, whether it's your, your first day of the job in a company that does this, or your first day in an open source project, you immediately start learning. Uh, Jesse Newland, uh, who does a lot of chat ops at GitHub, um, works on our ops team. I like the way that he says this, you learn by lurking and you teach by doing, um, which I think is a really interesting uh, concept. It's like, just simply by doing your job, you're teaching the person next to you uh, to do their job as well. And, and again, it doesn't matter what your process is. It doesn't matter what methodology you use. Th this process naturally exposes, or these tools naturally expose the process that you use. Uh, and to quote Jesse again, by placing tools directly in the middle of the conversation, everyone is pairing all the time. I think that's an awesome concept. So, in summary, these are the principles of open source. We have transparency, which enables participation, which enables collaboration. Uh, basically, I mean, if you, if you take one thing away from this talk, this is the idea. Prefer tools that inherently capture information and expose the process of your team. And that might look different for your team than it does you know, for someone else's team. Uh, and so you have to experiment with all of these things and figure out what are those tools. Uh, going back to uh, Conway's Law, uh, a coworker of ours, Jesse Toth, um, gave a talk a long time ago where she finished with kind of this idea of flipping Conway's Law on its head. And so instead of uh, letting the organizational structure dictate the, the design that we choose, or the, the design that we implement, we should model our teams and our communication structures after the architecture that we want. Uh, and what I love about this idea is that it doesn't matter what your role is in the organization. Like, as you start to change the way that you communicate, you can start to influence the structure of the organization. So if, you know, say you're working on a team uh, that, that's very meeting-centric uh, and information is lost all the time, your job on that team can be to start to document those meetings, like create an archive Find, figure out ways to create that, that communication trail. And then maybe, you know, someday, someday somebody's gone and misses a meeting. Now your notes become valuable and they can start to see the value of that. Or start to write some automated tests for things that annoy you. Um, and then someday, you know, over time, people will start to see the value of that and hopefully slowly the communication and, and team structure will start to change. So these are just a few of the lessons that I think we can learn from open source. I mean, I, I focus mostly on communication structure. But I think open source has a lot to say about you know, technical aspects. Like we can learn about good and bad design patterns. Um, we can learn about architecture. We can learn about new tools. I mean, things like Git itself came out of the open source community um, trying to solve challenges that those, those people are facing. We can also learn about social uh, structures. We can learn about conflict resolution, overcoming cultural differences, collaboration and coordination. Uh, there's economic factors, so, so dealing with motivation, uh, resource allocation, which is an interesting one in companies. I hope somebody soon gives a talk about that. Um, and we can deal about political structures. So what does it look like in, for governance or decision making within a company? Uh, if you want to think, be, you know, spend more time thinking about some of these things or reading about them, I mean, obviously the, the same advice that applies to open source can apply to our companies. And so I'd recommend these two books. Uh, the Success of Open Source is written by a political scientist. Uh, not a software developer at all, but trying to understand uh, what is unique about the software process, uh, the open source process. And then producing open source software is a really practical book on actually how to do, how to do open source from, you know, picking an issue tracker and version control system all the way to dealing with conflict and, and legal issues. So, uh, just to wrap up, uh, I want to use a quote from the success of open source. So the steam engine was the metal behind the first industrial revolution, but the revolution was a set of ideas about organizing factories, limited liability corporations, trade unions, and daily newspapers. 
there's a lot of things that we can learn practically from open source, but I think the, the bigger impact is going to be taking the process and applying it to other things. I mean, we're learning now how to apply it to our, our companies, even though the source code doesn't end up being open. Other industries are learning how to apply it, so open government, open data. Um, it's going to be interesting to watch the trickle of some of these principles into these other organizations or other industries. So thank you very much.